Good morning. Please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to do something I've never done before. And I've been uh, an elder here in this church longer than I want to know. And um, I'm going to use two passages of scripture in the morning as well as in the afternoon. We're going to try to blend them together. And so first of all, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 23. This is the word of the living God. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to, said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Now Mark relates the identical passage, the identical situation here, in his gospel, let's go to Mark chapter 6. You'll have to be a little bit dexterous, if that's the right word for your fingers, be able to go back and forth from Matthew and Mark. But Mark relates the same thing. And I want you to notice there will be some things that he will add, and there will be some things that he will omit. This is the word of the living God. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. That's added by Mark. While he sent the multitude away, and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then, this is something that Mark adds, he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. That's something that Mark adds, he would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the seas, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And this is something that Mark adds. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. When you arrive at a truly amazing narration such as this, Jesus walking on water. Normally when you say someone was walking on water, you equate that with the divine. I recall watching a movie years ago and some man had done something spectacular and the men were just beside themselves saying, I've never seen anything like this. And they would say, I've never even heard anything like this. Where is this man? And one man says, he's over there walking on water. Whenever you say walking on water, right away people think of this particular passage. And this is really an incredible narration by Matthew as well as Mark. And this task to preach, to teach, this particular passage, for me, is it's beyond my ability. No mere mortal can really bring out what, what happened and bring out the emotion of it, if you will. I mean, have you ever seen him walk on water? They have a lizard called the Jesus Christ lizard. You've heard of him. I'm sure some of you have. This lizard, because he's lighter than, than water, he can literally run on top of water. That's why they call him that. But just to preach this, 
It's beyond me. And so I found the safest way to do this is to deal with context, explain the text, and then apply. If I could use a really bad illustration, you know what I could think of? I'm not that smart. But if you go to a restaurant, the context of that restaurant, if, whether you're going to El Torito, that's Mexican food, big surprise to you, I'm sure. Uh, you go to Los Alamitos Fish Company, okay, we're expecting to eat fish. Morton Steakhouse, we're going for steak. Benihana's, we're going Japanese food, that type of thing. That's the context. Then you get inside the restaurant and you open up your menu. You don't expect to open up a Benihana's menu and find Morton Steak menu, right? No, because the context is Benihana's or El Torito. You know, that's your context, your, that's your text, I should say. That's what you're going to order. And it does you no good to order a meal and not eat it. You have to partake of it. So context restaurant, text, the menu. This is not a good idea here to do this right before we eat, but I'm sure your stomachs will, will hold out. And then you have to eat, partake of it. So what we're gonna look at, we'll look at the context, we'll look at the text, and then we will apply. But before I deal with the context and the text, uh, there's a reality, there's a truth that needs to be accompanying us while we go through this particular passage. And that is fear, fear. Now, before sin entered the world, before Adam sinned, there was no fear. There was no sickness. There was no sorrow. There was no pain. As a result, there was perfect peace. That's what Adam had, perfect peace with God. Adam did not have to be afraid of anything when the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that was in them was made and God made Adam from the dust of the earth. There was nothing for him to fear at all, nothing at all. But when he sinned, he became guilty before God as well as his entire family. That includes us. We were in Adam when Adam sinned. And when that happened, now there's pain, now there's sickness, now there's viruses, now there is sorrow, now there is death, there are dangers about us, and as a result, there's something that comes within us, and it's called fear. You could be walking down the street, and that siren goes off, and what's the first thing that hits you sometimes? For me, it's fear. Whoa, what was that? What was that? Sudden noise. A sudden noise can make you fear, but it's something that is common to all. There are fears common to all. It, by a degree, but that is a result of sin. There's other emotions too. My intention is not to go through the emotions that came about because of the fall of Adam. But one thing we do know, that when we sinned in Adam, there is indeed fear within us. In uh, the book of Micah, there is the eternal state described uh, in 4-5. And it's in a metaphor that everyone shall sit under his vine and no one shall make them afraid. In Zephaniah 3.13, the remnant, those who are saved, those who are in Christ, shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. While fear is indeed common to all, there are fears, there are also comforts for the Christian, there are temporary comforts around us. And in order for us, really, as we take a look at these two particular passages, we have to understand that the disciples feared. We have to have that. We, no one comes to church with a blank sheet. You know what I mean? You don't come in here and say, I have no idea what he's talking about when it comes to fear. We all know it. Now, granted, we want our children not to grow up with fear, but it's something that is common. So this is something for us to hang on to now as we now look at the context of our particular passage. The context is that we are in the midst of our Lord's ministry. He's probably in the third year of his, of his ministry. And after hearing the, the news of the beheading of John the Baptist, our Lord takes his disciples away to a deserted place for rest. However, a multitude hear about it, and they want to go to our Lord, and they go after him. And then something wonderful happens. Our Lord teaches the multitudes there, but he does something miraculous. With a very small amount of loaves, five loaves and two fish, he feeds over 5,000 men besides women and children. Okay? John's gospel in John chapter 6 relates the same thing. And he says that the people were so enraptured by this miracle that they were going to take Jesus and make him king. But that was not the intention of our Lord's miracle. In fact, here in this particular passage, he sends his disciples away 
one way, and he sends the 5,000 another way. He did not want his ministry to be reduced to be nothing more than feeding people. And so as a result, he sends them in opposite directions. He puts his disciples into a boat, and he has them to row five miles across the Sea of Galilee, probably around 6, 7 o'clock at night, somewhere in that neighborhood. There's the mention of, of the fourth watch. The first watch is from 6 to 9, second watch 9 to midnight, Midnight to three is the third watch. Three to six is the fourth watch, just by way of reference right there. But anyway, just so his disciples are not distracted, it appears that our Lord sends them off, and then he goes up to the mountain, and he prays. Now, the Bible doesn't say what, is he, what he prays about, but we can assume he's probably uh, in, in, in communion with his Father in heaven, as well as to pray for the 5,000 as well as his 12 disciples, which brings us now to our text, which begins in verse 24 of Matthew. I'll be going back and forth from Matthew as well as Mark. So the boat with the 12 are halfway across the Sea of Galilee in verse 24. And they are in trouble because the wind and the waves, they are against them. They are contrary to them. Now remember, four of them are tough fishermen. They are accustomed to a very difficult time on the sea. They're used to that, okay? If you were to ask them, those four fishermen, do you think it's wise for us to make a night crossing? They would probably say no, but remember, Jesus compels them to go. So they obey our Lord and they go, okay? Difficulties come. It's about, it's late, it's the fourth watch now. Chances are they've probably been rowing for maybe six hours or so. It's dark. It's an angry sea. Have any of you been on the ocean at night? It's the strangest thing. When you look out, I've been on, I did a night crossing with my father-in-law one time. I will never do that again. But all, the sky and the sea are the same color. It's, and if, if, you have, if you have a cloud layer, it's even dark. You have no moon. You have no stars. And if you have no light as you're heading over to Catalina, it's dark. It does indeed put a little bit of the fear of God in you and a fear of the ocean and the elements. Now, these men were not in a motorboat. They were rowing, probably their backs to their destination as they are rowing to head to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they've probably been rowing for quite some time, probably a little cold, a little fatigued, and a lot of afraid. When you look at verse 25 of Matthew... You see that it's the fourth watch, and Jesus goes to walk, goes to them. In Mark's gospel, it, it says that he sees them straining. Shows his deity right there. Five miles away, it's dark. Chances are a natural man's not gonna be able to look out five miles out into a black ocean sea, sorry, and be able to see their faces. So chances are our Lord's deity comes into play here, it's him being God and man. He sees them straining. They are in current danger. They are probably fearful for their lives. It was not an odd thing for a man to drown in the Sea of Galilee. But he goes to them, walking on water. Walk, I mean, and just the way that our writer brings it out is kind of matter of fact. Oh, and he walks on water. There's no wow, there's no exclamation points. It's, he walks on water. This is what is expected because he is the son of God. And in Mark's gospel, and what we read, it said he would have passed them by. The way that he was walking, he was a little bit away from them, not close walking to them. He was walking away from them as if he was gonna go to the other side. That's the impression that, you, that we get from that. So here they are, they're straining, they're fearful, it's night, it's a black sea, the wind's knocking them down, water probably coming into the boat, they are cold, they have natural fears, that's one fear. But another fear happens now. With their backs to their destination so they can see something coming on, off to the side, walking away from them, they have a new fear. It's a fear of the unknown. They call it a phantasm or a ghost. It's a ghost. That's what they all say, and they say it out of fear. That's what uh, Matthew's gospel says. They cried out for fear. This is a new level of fear, a fear of the unknown. I mean, how do I explain that? 
I've never seen a ghost. I may have seen something that looks like a ghost going to Disneyland, but that's not a ghost. It's all, you know, people are all singing, they're all happy and everything. It's not in the cold of night on a boat with waves pounding on you and you see something walking that you don't know what to say except it's a phantasm, it's a ghost. That's a new fear. But Jesus brings peace to them by a simple word, it is I, do not be afraid. And in Mark's gospel, he gets into the boat and there's a calm. But Matthew brings out something that Mark doesn't bring out. And that is Peter walking on water. Let me, let me address something real quick. Like Some would say, why is it that Matthew reports it? Mark doesn't. I think it's the wrong question. But it, it's got to be asked because I just did it. I just asked the wrong question. And because of the fact you're curious people, if you ask out of curiosity, no problem. But we do remember, when you have four gospel writers, and they have an intent, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, of what it is they want to bring to their audience. Some will leave out some things, some will include other things. Their intention is not to include every single solitary fact and event that they know of. They are only there to write as inspired by the Holy Spirit to give exactly to their audience what their audience needs, something that would leave an impression on their soul. For some reason, Mark decided to leave it out. Matthew kept it in. The question we should ask is, what can we learn from Matthew and what can we learn from Mark as opposed to, why didn't Mark include Matthew's account? It doesn't matter. The most important thing is, what can we learn from this particular portion? Well, let's take a look at Peter. Peter here, in verses 28 through 32, exhibits faith and doubt. They coexist, faith and doubt. But I would submit to you that his faith is courageous. He gets out of the boat. Notice it's not a calm. Now, if it's calm, different story. No problem. I can get out of the boat. I can walk. That's, that's fine. I can give it a shot. I know I'll sink, but I can swim back to the boat. No problem. It's boisterous. It is very chaotic, and yet there's courageous faith here by Peter. But I want you to notice that faith and doubt coexist with Peter. Peter answered him and said, Lord, that's faith. If it is you, that's doubt. Command me to come to you on the water. That's faith. The Lord says, come. He gets out of the boat. That's faith. Then he looks around him. Things are boisterous. He begins to sink. That's doubt. And then what does he say? Lord, save me. That's faith. It just goes to show that within this saint, Peter, faith and doubt coexist. And even our Lord gives a mild reproof to Peter. Why did you doubt? You looked around, you took your eyes off of me, and then you began to sink. Why did you doubt? It's a mild reproof. Our Lord doesn't Ream him over the coals. It's a very, very mild report. Our Lord knows what he does. And then we see that the wind ceases. Matthew 33, the disciples prove Jesus' deity by worshiping him as the Son of God, ascribing all honor and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Mark report, reports something in addition before their worship. Gets into the boat. The wind ceases. They were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. So here, Matthew omits something that Mark adds, just as Mark had added something that Matthew had omitted. Here, Mark adds something here. And that is that the disciples were greatly amazed beyond measure. They were amazed that it was the Lord Jesus and not a ghost. They were amazed that he got into the boat, that he walked on water. They were amazed that everything was calm after he got into the boat. Now remember, this is not the first time this has ever happened, of Jesus calming the sea. In Mark, I think it's in Mark 4, Matthew 8, where our Lord is asleep in the boat, and the waves come again. And disciples are fearful. And they wake our Lord saying, don't you care? We are perishing. He gets up and he stills it. Okay, so this is not the first time our Lord has done this. He stills the water. 
But for some reason, they were so amazed beyond words. Words really cannot go into the proper emotion they were going through. They were amazed in such a way that it was a bad amazement. Why? Because their heart was hardened. Now, we should be amazed at reading this. I think we would be amazed. There's an amazement that leads to faith. An amazement that praises the Lord. That's the type of amazement that the disciples here didn't have. Because their heart was hardened. That's what, the, that's what the passage says. Their heart was hardened. What happened? What, what was going on here when our Lord gave them this reproof, if you will? It looks like there's an interaction here, which is not in Scripture. And I'll be able to prove it here in a minute. But they were beyond... They were beside themselves. Words just couldn't properly describe their emotion. We, we, we do that all the time. Uh, you're really happy about something, super excited, even though those words probably don't measure up to that excitement. When I got married, love just didn't man. That, that wasn't the right word. You know, I needed a bigger word for my wife and I. And as time gone on, that, that, word, that word's gotten bigger. But, it's, you know, love just doesn't do it. The words sometimes just don't match up with the emotion. That's okay. We try. We do what we can. That's what the writers try to do. That's what Mark tried to do. To the best of his ability, try to give out exactly what was going on. Why were these men so amazed? Why were their hearts hardened? Their amazement does indeed spring from a lack of understanding about the loaves. The loaves? What, what does that have to do with anything, you might ask Mark? If they had grasped, if they had understood Christ's power to feed 5,000 by multiplying a very small amount of loaves and fish. Why does he say loaves and fish, by the way? I would submit to you, he's really not talking about the feeding of the 5,000. He's talking about what was left over. I'll prove it in the afternoon. But I think that they were amazed, but our Lord said that their hearts were hardened by the Holy Spirit because of the fact that they didn't understand that there was leftovers? This is making no sense whatsoever. Stay with me. Hang in there. If our Lord could multiply, if there would be leftovers, that's the evidence that you can see is the leftovers. When someone eats, how do you know if someone's eaten? You can't tell. Unless their belly gets big and they ate a lot. That's about it. You know, or they're now they're nice and satisfied. You really have no evidence that 5,000 people got eight unless, well, wait a minute, you got these baskets full of bread. Okay, now I got it. The Lord was able to provide more than what the 5,000 needed. Okay? But their heart was hardened. They didn't understand. Their amazement led to a question. Amazement. And they didn't conclude that he was the son of God at this particular time. But if our Lord could take care of 5,000 people, it would not be that tough for him to walk on water. That is what they should have concluded. When you go back to Matthew, it appears that there is this interaction between our Lord and his disciples. It appears that way because in verse 33 it says then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying truly you are the son of god doesn't it look like two different groups of people here the one group is fully amazed right this group worships him as the son of god i think our lord instructed his disciples their hearts were hardened not in the hardness of heart like a pharisee which had no faith in Jesus. But their hardening here was that they did not understand, they did not comprehend, they did not meditate and understand all that was going on with the feeding of the 5,000. Do you think our Lord's intention of feeding the 5,000 was only to fill their bellies? Do you think that when God gives us food, shelter, and clothing, it's just strictly for us to have food, shelter, and clothing? In one sense, yes. But in another sense, there should be some understanding that we gain from that. Well, they were beside themselves, and they were instructed, and it appears that they were properly instructed in such a way that they said, truly, this is the Son of God. In spite of their spiritual drowsiness, their laziness, even though they were amazed, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be amazed. They should be amazed to a point that they say, truly, this is the Son of God, not to say, I have no idea what's going on, I'm just amazed. 
I didn't even think about the feeding of the 5,000. Didn't think about that at all. I have no idea what's going on. They should be able to draw some particular conclusions based upon the feeding of the 5,000 as well as the leftovers. They were properly taught, and I think Matthew proves it, that afterwards they said, truly, this is the Son of God. Well, what? Okay, we're, we're done with the restaurant. We're done with the menu. We're waiting for our food to arrive. Let's eat. Here's some points of application. Understanding. We want to be understanding in all this. And I say the first thing is, keep in mind that it was our Lord that sent his disciples into quite a fearful situation. Our Lord was the one that sent these disciples into an extremely fearful situation. And he waited till the fourth watch to appear to them and to calm their fears with a word, fear not, it is I. Difficulties come our way by our loving Savior's direction. He may tarry till the last watch. He may. He may wait until you pass from this life into the next life. He may wait. But he comes with comfort. Now many in our congregation have suffered through sicknesses, cancers, open heart, a new heart being taken, I mean, an old heart being taken out of a man and a new heart being shoved in, if you ex ex excuse the uh, analogy there. Uh, many have gone through difficulties with regards to family. There's trials, sicknesses. There's just difficulties. We live in a cursed creation. There's no way of getting around it. And it appears sometimes that God has may have even abandoned us. You keep straining under those fears, maybe till the fourth watch. And yet he comes. The Lord Jesus comes and he comforts us. I'm going to be redundant. Our Lord sent his disciples away knowing that they would encounter fears. Raging seas are ordered by God, our Heavenly Father for our good, as well as for his glory. Question is, what did we learn from the situation, from the difficulties? Even the, 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 the chronic um, sicknesses that many in our congregation go through, what did we learn? Are we amazed? Or have we concluded that Jesus is the Son of God and he comforts his people? I trust that we conclude that Jesus comforts his people. He comes to us and comforts us during these difficult times. I have a question. Where is your faith? Why did you doubt? I'm saying this to me. You go through those times... And I look back, and I'm thinking, Rick, you didn't respond like a Christian. What is the matter with you? Why did you doubt? Where is your faith? And then you realize five, six years later, wow, I, I'm still here. I'm still believing. I'm still in Christ. I'm sure many of you may say the same thing. I'm sure you're much better than I am. But faith is not things will turn out good. That's not faith. Faith is kissing the hand of our Heavenly Father in difficult times and good times, saying, Lord, what is it that you are doing? I know you know what you're doing. I'm not sure I know what you are doing. But I know one thing is that whether it's a trial, whether it is correction, difficulties, whatever it may be, this is ordered by you, and this is for your glory. I should give you thanks and praise you. I have not cursed you. I have not turned my back on you. It's only by your grace that I am what I am. But this has come about by your hand for my good. You have to kind of talk to yourself sometimes when you go through these difficult seasons. Difficult times as well as good times. Good times we should praise the Lord. What happens with good times, we get a little fat and lazy. We're not as importunate in our praying. We're not as fervent in our praying. We get into a very difficult trial. Things change. Now we're, we're praying more. 
Maybe we're reading our Bibles more. Maybe our dependence is more on the Lord more. But it appears that the Lord used these trials and difficulties, as James said, for our good and for God's glory. And remember this. This is not original with me. You've probably heard me say this a hundred times if you've heard me say it one time. Smooth seas never made a good sailor. And an easy time for a Christian doesn't make a good Christian. There are difficulties that you will encounter. Or if you haven't already encountered them, it is for your good. There are so many conflicts that come into us. Why did we doubt? Where is our faith? Our faith is in the Lord through the difficult times as well as through the good times. We praise the Lord for his goodness is mighty. And no trial, no discipline is pleasant at the time. Now, some, by degrees, might be higher than others. Others may be really stretched. Others, not so. But as a a good brother told me one time, he said, you know, a broken arm still hurts. So whether someone is broken-bodied, if you will, and someone just has a fractured finger, it still hurts. So in different areas that we find ourselves in, in different seas, different watches that we are in, our hope is in the Lord. Now here in church it's easier, but when you get out there and you go through the trials and the difficulties, a difficult week of work, whatever it may be, difficulty within the family, whatever that may be, the Lord has brought that to you for a test of faith. If you could see everything as a test of faith, I I see that these poor disciples failed in many ways of their test of faith. But you know what? They grew. They learned from this. But they had to go through this. Everything is a test of faith. Everything that comes your way is a test of faith. I'm going to school. Test of faith. Kids, clean your room. Test of faith. Will Will you obey your parents? Difficulties within a marriage. A test of faith. What will we do? It's a test of faith. But all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And I want you to notice that that, that faith and doubt does indeed reside within us. Faith and doubt. Now, this is not a stamp of approval to be unbelieving. I'm just telling you the reality of being a Christian for X amount of years. At times, doubt will come in. It happened to Peter. Lord, that's faith. If that's you, that's doubt, he began to sink. That's doubt. Lord lifts him up. It just happens within the Christian experience that we will experience times of faith and times of doubt. But don't you dare run away from the Lord during those times of doubt. You run to him. Run to him through the means of his word. Don't forsake church when you're having doubts that's the time you need to be in here and when you're thriving spiritually this is the time to be here every season of life we should be under god's word to publicly praise god isn't god worthy to be publicly praised at the very minimum in spite of our our difficulties our temptations even our sins yes he's worthy to be praised and again i'm not saying that we are to Sin. Because I'm going to say something that I think we learn more from our failures and our difficulties than we do from our triumphs. But I'm not saying we learn more from our sins. It's not a stamp of approval to go out and sin and say, I want to learn more, so I'm going to sin. That's not what's being taught here. It's being taught. Temptations come. Difficulties come. We go through those seas. Those are difficult times. We learn more from that than we do on a calm sea in the middle of the day as we row towards the Galilee. We learn more the other way, the more difficult. This really puts a huge kibosh on this Christian ministry, if you will, of Christian prosperity. Unless you're prospering, you're not a Christian. This puts a complete squash on that because we learn a lot more from our trials and tribulations as well as adversity than we do from our prosperity. I've gone over and over and over again on this. I want to end on something that's wonderful here. Look at this beautiful picture of salvation with Peter. Peter sinking. 
Notice he doesn't try to swim to the boat. Notice he doesn't try to generate enough faith to get back up on the water and walk to our Lord. He doesn't call out to his pals in the boat for help, does he? Nor does he look within himself to see if he might be able to generate enough faith for him to somehow, some way, not drown. No, he fixes his eyes on the captain of his salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our testimony. When the Lord Jesus saved us, we were drowning in our sin. When we saw our sin, and we saw that we are in grave danger of facing God without any hope at all. I'm not looking back to my Romanism. I'm looking to my family to save me. I can't even look to those who care for me. I can only look to Jesus Christ. Lord, save me. And he does. He does. Jesus is willing. He is willing. Doubt no more, as the hymn writer says. So, did we learn anything today on this cruise across the Galilee? It was anything but a cruise. But I trust that by, God, by God's grace that we will see our Lord and Savior in all his beauty, amazed to praise him as the Son of God and the Savior of our souls. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we praise you. We thank you that you've ordered all things after the counsel of your will for our good as well as for your glory. And we praise you. We thank you for our salvation that we enjoy in Jesus Christ. We thank you that the difficulties, our sicknesses, our cancers, our heart issues have been ordered by you for our good and for your glory, for your praise. And we praise and thank you that you use all things for our good and for your glory. We pray for those here that do not know you. We pray that you would have mercy on them. Show them what a great Savior your Son is, of what great sinners they are, and that your Son loves to save great sinners. Thank you for your mercy towards us. Another Lord's Day, we remember the death and resurrection of our Savior. We worship you, and we praise you. We give you thanks. That you would seal these words to our heart, that the preacher would be forgotten, the message remembered, Christ would be glorified. Hear our prayers, for we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.